that sort of uh, white glove approach where it's it's going to be somebody who's going to handle through that entire process. We, I feel like we're, we're uniquely positioned to do that. And a lot of the people that we have, um, that we, we count as resources and allies in that are people that are on this call now. And I thank you for that. And, and Melissa, of course, I thank you for uh, putting together some really substantial, fantastic programming with uh, some really high caliber guests and really high caliber presentations. And uh, I'm looking forward to listening. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much, Carl. Appreciative of your support uh, as well as your ability to join us uh, this morning for this. So thank you for that. Uh, and uh, before we get started, one more word from our sponsors, a quick video from our friends at uh, AARP New Jersey, who again, we are also happy to have um, you know, join us uh, for these webinar series and appreciative of their support. So just give me one quick second. I'm Joanne Jenkins with AARP. In these challenging times, we need each other more than ever. We may be apart, but we're not alone. Use AARP Community Connections to find or create a mutual aid group near you. Stay connected and help those in need. Great. So that was just, again, a quick word from uh, our other sponsor at AARP New Jersey, and we're thankful uh, for their partnership and their assistance in putting together our programming for this series. And so without further ado, let's get to the actual reason that you're all joining us this morning uh, and the information that we're here to share with you. So we have with us this morning um, two uh, wonderful panelists who are going to share their experience thus far in dealing with COVID and addressing the needs of the communities that they serve. Um, and first up in that is is uh, Katie York with Lifelong Montclair. Uh, and so Katie, I am gonna go ask you to go ahead and unmute yourself. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna hit stop share on my screen so that you can pull your slides up and then we'll, uh, we'll get going. And then I will mute myself so that you can take over. <laughs> Great, I just need participant sharing enabled. Oh, did I not do that? Oh, here we go. Security. Got it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right. Okay. All right. Everybody all see yours. <laughs> Great. Um, as Melissa mentioned, my name is Katie York and I'm the Director of Senior Services and Lifelong Montclair for the Township of Montclair. It is a privilege to be here to share how we're moving forward together, learning from other communities like you and our own experiences to figure out what comes next. Lifelong Montclair began as a part-time consulting gig back in February 2014. Since then, it has grown to be part of the local government as the Division of Senior Services and Lifelong Montclair, and there are three full-time employees, Linda Tate, pictured here on the left, Michelle DeWitt on the right, and me, I think, in a tiny box on your screen. I'm not sure. So what did we do in the before times, um, as I'm calling it now, since it seems like an entirely different world? Before COVID, we tried to improve all areas of our community. We worked toward building a transportation network thanks to our Senior Bus Roundtable, which consists of older residents. We also looked at housing, housing advocacy, and education efforts all coalesced into the formation of the Montclair Senior Housing Action Group. We worked toward addressing um, ageism through culture change initiatives, and we developed and put on programming uh, at Edgemont Park House and through The Mill, which is our Institute of Lifelong Learning. Key factors that have been essential to our work are uh, ensuring older adults are involved at every stage and engaging partner organizations. And these tenants have stayed with us during these transitions. In the beginning of March, um, we made the decision to close Edgemont Park House, which is the site of programming for our older adults, and we canceled our senior bus. Then we had to figure out how our team could work from home, especially before IT provided us with essential tools. Michelle and I had laptops, but none of us had work cell phones. Uh, and in fact, Linda only had her home landline. So we quickly had to redefine our areas of focus and make things work within the resources we had. We called all of our lists and databases to create a list of people that we knew had limited support systems. Linda started regularly calling people um, using star six, seven to block her home phone line. And Michelle started collecting names for our food delivery program. Speaking of our food delivery program, let's talk about it. Before we shut down the senior bus that had been heavily used for grocery shopping, we connected with the executive director of a local soup kitchen called Tony's Kitchen. 
She had already started conceptualizing a weekly food delivery for older residents, regardless of their means. The Montclair Kiwanis quickly joined to oversee volunteer drivers. The gentleman in the top right is Peter Ebling. I have never met Pete in person, but we now communicate multiple times per week. He even highlights the most important things in the emails he sends to make sure I can read them quickly. Our Senior Citizens Advisory Committee uh, has helped source food donations, food distribution companies, even gone on a hunt for toilet paper, including getting some from the local hotels. And local businesses have donated food, time, and vehicles to assist with delivery. So how is the food delivery process working? Well, first an older resident calls us, usually reaches Linda or Michelle, and they're added to our spreadsheet. Pete then reaches out to a team of volunteers sometime in the week to see who is in or out for driving for the week, and he'll send me an update. Near the end of the week, I use Google My Maps to map the recipients and adjust driver assignments as needed, and you can see what craziness that looks like on the right side of your screen. And then during that week, Tony's Kitchen is preparing meals and assembling bags of produce, shelf-stable stable foods, and three to four prepared meals. They, along with the Montclair Center Business Improvement District, deliver bags of food to the senior buildings as well. In total, this process allows us to deliver food bags to over 500 older, older residents per week, including Charlie, who you can see here in, uh, with his dog, Rosie. And um, this process has come together so organically, and it is flexible enough at this point that we can add somebody, um, if they call me on Friday, we can add them and they'll get food delivered the very next day. So while we were developing a food delivery program and conducting wellness calls, we also knew we had to do something to prevent and or address social isolation. We had just started our sixth year of the mill or Montclair Institute of Lifelong Learning, offering free high level multi-week courses to Montclair area residents 55 plus. Since the beginning, the mill's popularity had grown quickly. It was not unusual for a class to fill in the first minute after the online only registration opens and for several classes to fill in the first 10 minutes. So when the pandemic hit, we knew we had to do what we could to keep the mill going in some way, and registration in the spring semester were quickly approaching. On March 10th, we reached out to our mill buddies, who are mill students who typically would assist fellow students with registration in person using their own computers. These buddies agreed to start reaching out by phone to the people they had helped in person in the past. They walked through tech abilities and access and shared the course listing with their partners. On March 16th, some of our older residents and Michelle began testing online platforms to see which would make the most sense for us. Eight days later, we contacted all of our mill instructors scheduled for the spring semester to find out what capabilities they might have for online learning and made instructor swaps as needed since some didn't have the capacity to teach via Zoom. We then purchased licenses for Zoom after our testing, we determined that was the best choice for us. Um, that was on the 1st of April, which if you do the math for the next um, bullet, you can see classes start fewer than two weeks later and registration started five days later. And then when registration did open, we were inundated with registra registrants. So you can see the chart in the bottom right that shows our registrations over the first 10 minutes. Um, we had nearly 300 registrations in those first 10 minutes. The semester eventually rounded out to about 750 registrations, which in one semester, 750 registrations was about half of all of 2019's four semesters. And the term Montclair area became very broad as we saw registrations in Florida, Texas, and even Hawaii. While we were a little bit overwhelmed by the numbers, it was a little bit scary, um, they were also reassurance to us that we were meeting a need. And then on April 13th, we were fortunate that Montclair Prep, an organization who had conducted trainings on how to teach effectively on Zoom pre-COVID, provided a free training to our mill instructors. And I'm proud to say the semester launched the very next day. And it really launched. A librarian, Michelle and I, all provided tech support a half hour before every class and during drop-in sessions. And all of us, employees, students, and instructors alike, alike, learned in so many ways throughout the semester, which just wrapped up last week. Some classes were available for calling in by phone, and nearly all were broadcast on our local cable TV station and available on YouTube. We've continued via a virtual Edgemont classroom space on Zoom, modeling our Edgemont Park House on the ground. We're trying to keep that 
sense of continuity online. Uh, these classes can be accessed via video chat or landline. Michelle assembled a robust programming calendar that you can see here that has kicked off successfully and will carry through July until the next semester of the mill begins. So now the big question, what's next? We know we have to figure out how to bridge the technology gap, make sure everybody has access that they need at this point in time, and how to keep our older residents safe and well in every area, including their mental health. We don't know how long this will last. Uh, to put it in perspective, we're not planning on offering on the ground programming for the remainder of 2020. That's a long time. So I have a favor to ask of you. This is super corny, which is not usually the way I do things. So bear with me. Um, I'm asking all of you to be proud of the work you've done so far. We are all playing a part in something bigger. We're trying to slow the spread of the virus. We are hopefully saving lives and preserving our healthcare system. So I think given this long timeline, we really need to appreciate our progress to date to keep our energy up for the long haul. I hope we can continue this conversation. Um, please feel free to reach out to me and use any materials from these links that I've provided on our website. Thank you. I can learn to understand you much oh. better if I can get familiar with the way you talk. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> In Okay, so in trying to, uh, you know, put my video back on and unmute myself, I also let my computer talk to you also. Sorry about that for, uh, for that. Uh, but Katie, thank you for that um, wonderful presentation. And um, as um, I let uh, Sue uh, Brooks, our communications manager, unmute herself and, and uh, look at the chat box for questions, I first want to ask you, uh, because I did see someone ask in the chat box whether your program was just for Montclair, which technically, um, you know, your in-person stuff, I guess, is. But um, if you could speak to that maybe and let people know where they could learn more about other age-friendly initiatives in New Jersey and, and where they can learn more about that movement in general? Sure. Um, so our meal delivery, our food delivery program is just for Montclair, just mm -hmm. because of logistics, I'm sure mm -hmm. you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but we are opening up our mill classes and our Edgemont virtual classes up to everyone. Um, we had to purchase the highest level of Zoom to have access to some of the features that would help us do tech support, etc. Mm -hmm. So we have 300, um, a 300 person capacity per class. So please, we're paying for it, please join on. Um, so people are welcome to get that information. Uh, the best bet is to start at lifelongmontclair.org. Uh, we did put up our mill classes for the summer and that's at lifelongmontclair.org slash mill. Registration opens June 29th. So it is open. Um, and then there are several other communities um, that the Grata and Taub Foundation have funded. So feel free to check out their websites and there are more coming on, which is really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, not to further plug one of our sponsors, but people can also learn more about the age friendly movement, which they refer to as livable communities by checking out the, the link on their website for livable communities and learn more about how to become an age friendly community. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great resource too. Uh, and the other that's, I'm all about um, sharing, stealing, whatever you want to call it, uh, resources. So that's another good site to go to, to see um, other communities action plans, what they've been, been doing, what their surveys were that showed things in the community. So use that, take stuff. Yeah. By all means, ARP.org slash livable. Uh, and we, I know we probably have a lot of people who are asking whether or not you can share um, your slides. And so uh, if you're okay with that after the presentation, we can, uh, we can send out uh, those via email to folks. Of course. Yep. So Sue, do we have some other questions from the chat box? We do. And uh, Katie, we, were, um, we have somebody who asked if you could please email the website you just mentioned to everyone on the meeting. So that, we'll put that on the list of things to do. And this question is, given the overwhelming number of deaths in long-term care facilities and the social isolation of their residents during the COVID-19 quarantine, there may be backlash against moving into facilities such as continuing care, retirement communities, and assisted living facilities. What types of living situations do you think might become popular instead? single family residences, communal living, uh, naturally occurring retirement communities? Wow, give me a really easy question, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So one of the lessons that we've learned, uh, unfortunately, has been that um, the age segregated type of living, even the, you know, these senior buildings, the HUD senior buildings are really have had a hard time with this because everybody is quote unquote vulnerable within the building. Um, I don't think single um, family units are going to be the way to go in the future either, just because they're unless the neighborhood is built very intentionally, it's a lot harder to build a support network. So I think we're gonna see some more multifamily, multi-generational housing emerge, um, just so that there can be that benefit of intergenerational play that has just come under the microscope now when we see these buildings that it, it, all the residents are basically inside and, and can't go out, can't access the things that they need. Okay, thank you. And let's see, let me scroll back. Considering the examples where people have been successful at using technology, are there any small or quick efforts that have worked for your older adults who were not that familiar with Zoom or examples of intergenerational opportunities for students to coach older adults in using technology? Yeah, so um, it's been interesting because I think, um, COVID has really pushed people to, who are reluctant to use technology, maybe had the iPad at home, to really embrace it. Um, we still have people who are reluctant, and uh, that's why we've tried to harness TV34, which is our local cable TV channel. But that's not the same as seeing faces. As I'm sure you all know at this point, you know, a Zoom call in, in times like this, it's very different from watching a TV show. So, um, is there a quick and easy answer? No, but I think these opportunities where people get a chance to um, have drop in and test it and make mistakes. And I've been teaching a, a Zoom class um, and I'm on Zoom and I'm really just trying to encourage, just try it. I'll take off the security settings. I can see all your faces and I know how to kick you out if I need to. Try sharing your screen, try chatting, try doing these different things. So I think it's having the opportunity for people to mess around with it, play in the sandbox, if you will, outside of a program or before a program so that when the time comes, um, they feel comfortable to do it. And it's just, you know, at the beginning of the semester, people were, everybody was signing on a half hour before trying to figure out how to get their stuff set up. Um, and as we got towards the end of the mill semester, it's like people are just popping on at the time of class because they're good to go now. So it's, it's giving people multiple opportunities to practice both in you know, an informal setting, but also within having multiple programs that they could test it on. Um, another hard thing I think is switching back and forth between programs. So we've been very consistent about using Zoom. And then as far as intergenerational opportunities, I think that is certainly there. I think the issue is less about opportunities for training, because I think that's there. And it's more about getting people access to the internet. I know Comcast Internet Essentials is offering two free months, but it's, I've heard it's really hard to get signed up. And then it's like, here's a box, install the internet in your house. Um, and then devices, getting people devices as well. Although I think that's a much more easily uh, addressed issue. It's a lot easier to get a device in people's hands than an ongoing subscription to, an, to internet. So that's what we're trying to figure out now is how do we address that? Thank you. And then we have one share here. Um, you're welcome to check out our online programming on www.soma2townsforallages.org. We moved exercise classes online and offer one-time presentations too. So it's just a share. If we could share that in the email we send out too, uh, that would be great for Kathy. Great. Yeah. Okay. And I don't have any other questions. Oh, wait. Oh, so some might, more might be coming up. Uh, there are some other resources such as www.computara.com uh, does great job re mitigating computer anxiety and providing affordable computer lessons is another one. And uh, there's another one, uh, www.sociavi.com engineered by a business partner for the aging population. So there are some other resources that are popping up here. 
This is uh, this has been really great for everyone to be able to share resources as well in the chat box. And so we thank you for doing that and any of that that we can capture uh, and share with you in a follow up email so that you have it. Um, we will attempt to do so terrific. Thank you, Sue, for the questions from the chat box. And thank you, Katie, for uh, a great presentation. Um, and if we don't have any further questions, I'm going to throw it to Janelle and ask her to go ahead and unmute herself and share uh, your screen so that we can see your slides. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Melissa, um, I guess I'm going to jump right into it. <laughs> Let's see. I should. Anything we can do to help? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I think my Zoom settings just, I have to get it from <laughs> again. working now I believe so we I think we see your screen <laughs> so where did it go okay um all right, I'm just gonna shoot um my slides over to you Melissa because not uh, a problem for whatever reason this is not working out for me right now <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're uh, we're happy to uh, to pull them up for you, and we'll and we'll get it going in a moment. So just bear with us, folks. You know, this is what it is, right? We have uh, uh, the ability, just like uh, we just talked about with Katie's presentation. We have the wonderful ability of technology, but it takes us uh, sometimes some challenges to get uh, used to it or to uh, use it. And sometimes, despite what they say, these computers do what they want, even if we didn't ask them to. So uh, just give us a moment while we get Janelle's slides ready and we'll be, uh, we'll be with you shortly, so. Yeah, we, AFSC, so what we, what we do in our um, particular office, I'm the only social worker on staff, and so I work with our um, immigrant seniors and then also addressing um, mental health um, issues within our community population. And then I work with a bunch of attorneys who provide pro bono or low cost legal immigration services um, to individuals in the community and um, those who are being released to ICE detention facilities. We now have three offices around New Jersey. Um, two are in Newark, one is now in Red Bank. We identified um, a need for uh, legal services down in South Jersey and so it's been about a little over a year now that we had Red Bank there. And then we've also opened the second office in Newark for our detention team. They uh, provide public defender style model representation for immigrants in ICE detention facilities in New Jersey. We primarily um, oversee Elizabeth Detention Center and Essex County Correctional Center. Okay, and so you, you can go to the next slide maybe. So I just wanted to take a quick, quick glance at, um, these are just some stats for uh, senior immigrants in New Jersey and the US um, that I pulled up. So there's nearly 7 million US residents age 65 and older that are immigrants. In New Jersey, 22% of the foreign born, are foreign born individuals and 60% are aged 65 and older. So in New Jersey, the top countries of origin for immigrants are India with 12.5%, Dominican Republic 8.4% and Mexico 6. Um, uh, Philippines 4.5 and Korea 4%. So we are very um, diverse in New Jersey here. And according to the American Community Survey, 56% of the old and for, older foreign born population that spoke a language other than English at home spoke English less than very well compared with their native counter, uh, native born counterparts at 
So that's super important um, as I go into serve with, with a lot of the learnings in um, providing case management services to our senior immigrants is really identifying the barriers that prevent them from maybe accessing uh, needed services um, and really trying to figure out how to address those barriers to get them the help or the services that they need. We could go to the next slide. Okay. Yeah, we can go to the next one too. This is a little bit about our organization. Um, and I also just pulled up um, just a pyramid chart of just to give you an idea of how much the aging, populi uh, aging population in the immigrant community has changed in the US from 1960 up until 2017 and saying so we have less um, the popular immigrant population here in the US has as far as changed drastically and that may you know be due to different trends of migration obviously changes in immigration policies and things of that nature so if you look in 2017 um, you know the age of our senior I mean the amount of our senior immigrants has dwindled a bit and we can go to the next slide. So what are some of the barriers that I've identified that um, our, my clients face, um, even prior to COVID-19 pandemic? Um, obviously language access, that's, I feel like that's always gonna be one in a sense with uh, some of the immigrants that I work with, you know, depending as well, because some, you know, language resources are out there. Um, sometimes with more rare languages, it's a little difficult to identify those resources, but we try to, um, utilize volunteers and community-based services to address that. Isolation is always a big one. Um, as far as especially newly arrived senior immigrants who leave their cultures and their countries of origin, it can be a little overwhelming and isolating when you are leave what you're accustomed to and come into a new society and community and cultural norms in that sense. And that goes into acculturation and cultural differences. Um, you know, just the unfamiliar, unfamiliarity with U.S. social norms and values and taboos. Um, economic insecurity is a big one, and I'm going to go more into that as we go along and as to why medical treatment access for those uh, many can be uninsured or underinsured, so it can be difficult for them to access the treatment that they need. Immigrant immigration status or lack of. So I'm going to go into that as well. With the various amount of immigration statuses that exists, um, it can be super difficult as far as who's deemed qualified or not qualified for certain benefits. Immigration policies such as public charge and the five-year ban, I'm gonna um, review that as well. And then ver fear of verification and reporting. So many immigrants, they fear that they or a family member will be reported to Immigration and Customs Enforcement if they apply for benefits or utilize services. So many of them will avoid um, accessing them. And then one of the other things was long processing times for US uh, Citizenship and Immigration Service applications. You know, there's many individuals who wait years for applications to be processed and approved. Um, and it keeps a lot of people in limbo. Um, create, and, and you know, there's not a lot of safety net services in that sense for some of these individuals who are stuck in limbo for that time. And then we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so some of the barriers that I'm finding that they're facing um, with uh, during the pandemic now, um, still some of the same barriers that exist prior, but maybe more amplified in that sense. Um, language access for some services, it's even more difficult now just because not having that in-person and office um, encounter, it, it is a little difficult doing uh, language services over the phone, um, it, just different issues in that sense as far, and then finding obviously people who assist maybe with translations, it hasn't been the easiest during this time. Um, obviously immigration status as well as also, like I said before, a, um, a barrier, food access, um, and I'm going to go into that, especially, uh, you know, even those with NJ SNAP had some issues with accessing food, economic insecurity, medical treatment access, isolation, separate, even more aggressive separation from loved ones, friends, or any type of community uh, connections that they've had. Technology access and support obviously has been a huge one, um, trying to guide them in access and how to access uh, different services through technology public charge policy. Um, just be, this is one of the policies that affects the immigrant community tremendously because it's almost been like uh, kind of simultaneously when the pandemic happened, 
um, the uh, Trump administration had implemented and um, carried out new changes in this policy that incorporated uh, more need-based programming. So I'm gonna go into that and we'll see those programs and how it's affecting them. Uh, long delays for application processing, even more now since some of the, since office closures happened for a while. And then, you know, even in um, different relief programs like the CARES Act stimulus relief, many immigrants were excluded from that. We can go into the next slide. So what have we been trying to do to address these barriers? I mean, we've been obviously providing support in a culturally competent manner. We always have to. All my clients are different. They come from different cultures and, you know, whether even if they're all from across Latin America, every country has different norms, different uh, values, just different beliefs. Um, so it's, it's very important. And I try to, I really try to adhere and, and take note to that when I'm dealing with them individually. Um, utilizing linguistic support like so i've been <laughs> reaching out to people if i've had um clients that are in need of you know, language support i haven't had so much trouble with some of my seniors in the moment um i've been able to communicate with my with them directly myself so but there's definitely have been uh you know past clients that we've definitely had to reach out to whether it's somebody maybe who speaks urdu or you know another language or maybe even French. I'm not, <laughs> I don't really have a tons of people that speak French, um, but I even found using some of the linguistic support over the phone, the French sometimes is not the same as the French that my clients may speak. It may be different, um, you know, just because they're from different uh, countries. Identifying uh, COVID-19 related resources to support clients. So this has been something huge that I've mostly probably been doing. Um, and now I even have like an intern helping me with it. Um, food access, financial support, medical care, mental health, coalition groups, mutual aid groups. So we've been doing tons of research and, and uh, compiling like a doc, a PDF document to share with people um, on how to access these different services. Where are they? And so our clients are from all over New Jersey. So we have literally, you know, looking for resources from north to south. Um, so it's super important. Um, we just been compiling this information and sharing with clients um, because that has been like a big need as far as like clients coming, uh, calling us, how am I supposed to pay uh, maybe my rent? I, I can't access food, like where can I get food? Things of that nature. So, or how can they, you know, maybe talk to a doctor? Um, what are the COVID resources for a treatment? Things of that nature. Um, Developing a working knowledge of immigration statuses, benefit qualification, and policies affecting immigrants. So I came actually into this position like straight out of grad school, and it was definitely it's been a definite learning, <laughs> definitely learning for me. But um, and it's not really a custom, obviously, social workers to have to learn about you know legal terminology or statuses and regarding and policies regarding immigration, but. It is super helpful and it's important because you have being informed about the different policies and benefits in that um, benefit qualification for your clients. You want to make sure that you're giving you're making an informed decision as far as enrolling them maybe in a, in a benefit that won't affect them later down the line and that's important. Um, and that goes into some of the changes to public charge policy. Um, you want to be aware of identifiers, employment authorization documents, I-94s, prima facies, original judge's orders. So there's various forms of identifications and without those identifiers, they cannot access benefits rarely. It's just very difficult without them. Um, and I also encourage people just to join um, a coalition group or get involved in, with their grassroots agency if they're trying to maybe learn a little more about this community or, or you know, some of the workings around it. Um, and I can share some of the different uh, coalition groups that we work with across New Jersey as well. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. So just to give you an idea um, of work, when I say working knowledge, immigration status and issues, there's a variety of immigration statuses, some with pathways to citizenship, some without, unfortunately. Um, so that really matters in a sense too, as far as what clients uh, qualify for. So if you could see one of our previous clients um, advocating for a temporary protected status, 
um, trying to advocate for pathway to citizenship. So temporary protected status, a lot of them are, a lot of our clients that are TPS recipients are either seniors now or reaching senior age um, and have been here for a numerous amount of years. But unfortunately with that status, there's no pathway to citizenship. So it makes it very difficult in a sense. And it's not a guarantee they were, the uh, Trump administration was uh, announcing to ending the uh, TPS programs across different countries. Um, and so that didn't, um, not all of them went through and he actually extended the program again, but it's kind of like they're in limbo because they don't know if another year from now, the program's gonna be ended and they're gonna be asked to leave. And many of them have planted roots here as far as businesses, um, you know, worked their entire lives in, in the realms of retirement. Um, and so it's, it's very difficult in a sense too. So and we speak of retirement benefits with this particular group, they would not quite, even if they did have to leave the US um, and return to their country of origin, they would not have access to the retirement benefits that they paid into their entire lives. So it's very problematic and we have a large uh, TPS network across New Jersey. Um, they're very strong and, <laughs> they, they're, and then they're definitely, definitely very uh, self-advocating and they're awesome. And we have an organizer in our office that actually works with them directly on that, those issues. Um, forms of identification for different statuses. So there's, there's way more than just you know, citizenship, like I said, green cards, work authorization cards, and that can be for a variety of different statuses. Um, you can take a look at the picture on the right, we'll show you an, uh, an example of what an employment authorization card looks like. Um, and usually you could tell their status by where it says category code. Each status is coded differently, so you would be able to look, but you can Google that if you're not sure what somebody's status is, and you can see that right there. Um, prima facies are more, are more so for victims of domestic violence through VAWA. Um, and things of that nature. Some statuses will use um, benefits can, uh, recipients, they can utilize their original judge's order from an immigration judge to prove their status. Uh, you know, obviously identifying what barriers they have, experience of detention and deportation trauma effects on the individuals and families. And I say that even with senior immigrants as well, because there have been some clients that I've dealt, worked with that have come out of a nice detention facility that are of senior age with, you know, several medical issues um, and aside from all the other issues that they may be facing as far as immigration wise. So it, it's really, um, it's really daunting in a sense, but it does affect them as well. And uh, it's, it's not really, I, I feel like thought about so much with the senior population, but we definitely do have some clients that have been seniors coming out of ICE detention facilities and assisting them. And it's not, you know, obviously not the easiest thing to do. Um, I think I'll go to the next slide. So when you want to talk about benefit qualification uh, for immigrants, you really, this is kind of like a starting point. So any benefits that are federally funded, you, they, the federal government has deemed two lists, those who are qualified immigrants and those who are non-qualified. Uh, those who are under the qualified immigrants list will qualify for benefits. Um, and those who are under non-qualified will not. But this doesn't necessarily mean that they don't qualify for all benefits either. So it's, there's a little, it goes, it gets a little funny in a sense too. In some states obviously have their own fully funded programs for uh, the immigrant community to access with different statuses. Um, you know, for example, California has uh, health insurance that they fully fund for even, I think, up to undocumented immigrants. Uh, New York has some type of expanded Medicaid program that they ex extend, expand to um, certain immigrants as well. So if you could take a look, qualified immigrants are like your permanent residents, asylees, refugees, um, a status that's called paroled for at least a year, withholding of deportation or removal, Cuban Haitian entrants, and Marisian immigrants, trafficking victims. Uh, Non-qualified -stat non status, you look at these are people like TPS, temporary protective status, asylum applicants, uh, other lawfully present immigrants such as students and tourists, undocumented immigrants, DACA would fall under this as well, the deferred um, arrivals, and the individuals who don't fall under the qualified immigrant groups, including immigrants formerly considered permanently residing under the color of law, PUCO they call it. So it's, this <laughs> it gets very complicated in a sense, and you don't really have to really dwell deeply into that, but 
having just a basic idea and a knowledge of um, different statuses that exist can be helpful. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is just like a quick um, look at different, you know, some benefit qualifications and how I, sometimes when I'm doing presentations for the service providers, I, I try to give them, <clears throat> you know, cause a lot of people don't know like, okay, so if this person qualifies for a benefit, where do I look? So I always gear people to look to for programming through New Jersey administrative code. Everything is listed out there. Um, so if you take a look like for NJ SNAP, that is where New Jersey um, administrative code 1087 through 0.80 lists what status is qualified for that. Um, NJ family care, which including the age blind and disabled, because a lot of my clients don't um, qualify or don't have Medicare or retirement benefits. So a lot of them may be in um, Medicaid in the ABD program or TANF and general assistance. Um, some of these programs that are in New Jersey that are funded by the Office of Refugee Resettlement are New Jersey are these different offices like Catholic Charities, Jewish Vocational Services, and IRC Church Will Service. Obviously with the new administration though, our refugee admissions has been significantly reduced. Um, so I do know that they're helping individuals who are, are um, asylees as well more now. Uh, social security programming, to get a little a different idea of what the literature on who qualifies for certain programs and what are the parameters. You can take a look there and see it's, you know, uh, basically like 40 quarters of work, 10 years of work, obviously legally residing, age qualified to retire. That's some of the basics. Um, there's also when, depending on the person's status, if they have a work authorization, if they're getting retirement benefits, they have to have, um, they have to make sure that that card is valid throughout the entire time. So some people renew their EADs or work authorizations yearly. And sometimes it can take a couple months to get a new one. So we encourage clients to reapply earlier so that they don't um, have, you know, one of those gaps for a period of time between the cards um, expiration and validity. Because when that happens, social security programming benefits will stop. They suspend them until they have a new uh, valid card on file. So I've had that happen to some clients and it's been very, it, it proves very difficult because they, there's no safety net in the middle. Um, and then you, we, you, you know, with a lot of benefit systems, USCIS has what they have an electronic save verification system. Federal agencies use it to confirm public benefit eligibility to non-citizens. So in addition to demonstrating documents, they sometimes will run their information through this electronic system and it will tell them if they qualify for benefit or not. And then we can go to the next slide. Uh, federal and state policies affecting immigrants. So these are two, one of the, um, two pretty much of the big ones as far as benefits. So five-year ban, which varies by state. Um, those banned from federal and some state benefits for the first five years. Um, so even if you're in a qualified status, some benefits you have to wait five years before you can actually utilize them. And even as a permanent resident, you have to wait five years. If you're paroled for at least a year, you have to wait five years are granted conditional entry, which is usually a permanent resident with conditional entry. You cannot use it to benefit until you hit your five year mark. Um, and public charge is one of the big ones like I was saying prior. So public, what is public charge? It's something that US citizen, um, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services considers when an individual um, utilizes public benefit programs to deem if they would be a charge to the public or the government when they're applying for a certain non-citizen status or when they're applying for legal permanent residency. So we can go to the next slide. So public charge. Prior to uh, February 24th, public charge policy has always been in place. The programs that it included um, were very minimal. Basically any programs where there was cash uh, assistance in a sense. So TANF, general assistance, SSI, or, and then Medicaid usage for long-term institutional care, which would be like a nursing home or a mental health facility. Now, um, po from February 24th of 2020 and on, the Trump administration has expanded the inclusion of several programs, including non-emergency Medicaid. So any Medicaid uses in general, um, the SNAP program, any SNAP program usage, 
and housing assistance programs that include public housing, Section 8 housing vouchers, and project-based Section 8 rental assistance. Um, so in addition to all cash support income maintenance programs, they include a lot of these other basic need programs. So food access, housing, um, medical uh, insurance. Um, benefits that are excluded from public charge. There's a couple um, more so that would be related to some of our senior clients would be obviously energy assistance. Those programs are not incorporated. Transportation vouchers or non-cash transportation services. Um, advanced premium tax credits under the Affordable Care Act, things like that, and a couple others. Um, but these are um, some of the stuff that is disaster relief. So these are some of the programs that wouldn't entirely be included, and including like, um, you know, certain municipal programs, maybe the city has different meal programs and things of that nature wouldn't be incorporated under public charge for our seniors. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Uh, so public charge policies, um, yeah, so going more into it, individuals, so some miscon there's a lot of misconceptions around it too within the immigrant community. Um, and when the changes went through, we saw a big, um, uh, a lot of changes as far as like an accumulation of fear within the community of people disenrolling or avoiding applying. Um, so individuals can apply for benefits on behalf of their eligible family members without fear that they will be treated as receiving the benefits. So <clears throat> an example obviously would be a guardian receiving NG SNAP for US citizen children. I have a client, he is a senior immigrant and he is the guardian of his grandson. So, you know, this was one of the questions that he posed to me as well. Is this gonna affect me if I, you know, get assistance to um, help take care of my grandson? No, the answer is no. As long as the individual is applying for a benefit for someone else, if it's a minor, and not yourself, then you're absolutely, that's fine. Um, benefits aside from cash assistance, SSI long-term care with Medicaid used prior to February 24th, 2020 will not be included in public charge tests. So the changes are not retroactive. So if people utilize these benefits before that date, it won't affect them as long as they disenroll um, after. And can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Who isn't affected by public charge? So that's another misconception within the immigrant community. Not everybody is subjected to public charge. Depending on, it depends on your status. So people who aren't affected are those who are in humanitarian-based categories of immigrants, and those include um, people like refugees, asylees, VAWA self-petitioners, trafficking victims, U visa recipients, or U victims of serious crimes. Um, special immigrant juvenile status. Um, you will see that status with a lot of the unaccompanied minors <clears throat> that come into the U.S. Current legal permanent residents or green card holders. So, um, so green card. Sorry. And yeah, so public charge isn't um, people who are subject to public charge that are permanent residents applying for citizenship. They're not subject to public charge. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out where that noise is coming from. You know, it's on your end, Janelle, or if it's on mine. I don't think it's on mine, but just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my office <laughs> connected to my computer. That's okay. <laughs> um, anywho, uh, so U.S. military enlisted active duty or the spouse and child thereof. So some you, um, certain relatives of military personnel. Uh, some others who, of those who Department of Homeland Security has granted a waiver of public charge inadmissibility. So that is a, um, a possibility, doesn't always happen, but overall, anybody who's in a humanitarian based status won't be subject to public charge. And we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> All right, so some of the consequences of public charge that we've seen amongst our uh, clients and seniors is fear. Um, so we've had, I've had clients who have disenrolled or they avoided applying for public benefits, um, even those who have statuses that wouldn't have them subject to public charge policy. Um, and what, what's problematic obviously with this is it's perpetuating huge amount of food, housing and economic insecurity, especially amongst our seniors. Um, it's, it's really disheartening, um, you know, and even some of my seniors who are in immigration statuses that don't have a pathway to citizenship, that can always change in the future, we don't know. 
but it's very hard to tell somebody who needs maybe critical health care access, um, you know, through Medicaid, ABD, that they, you know, I can't tell them to choose between getting the care that they need now or the option of them not accessing it and um, to try to avoid having it affect them in the future down the line if they get the opportunity to become a permanent resident, maybe. Um, so you're actually, it's really problematic in the sense you're helping, telling your clients they have to choose between basic needs of survival and, you know, being able to get a pathway to citizenship eventually in the U.S. one day. Um, and then with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it was even more concerning because people were, would not, uh, you know, our biggest concern was people would not access treatment out of the fear that they'll be later subject to public charge. Um, and although USCIS released a statement that they wouldn't hold um, Medicaid usage uh, uh, for, to receive treatment for COVID-19 um, through diagnostic testing or any treatment of any nature related to it, um, other benefits that people may have needed, like to pay uh, rentals, like the rent with cash assistance programs, they didn't exactly deem those as being not subject to public charge. So people were still struggling in that sense. And so we had to come in and really look for some community-based resources and non-governmental be benefits for people to get by and to address their immediate needs. We could go to the next slide. <clears throat> so just some of the um, basic resources we were um, distributing for people for COVID-19. Just letting our folks know that FQHCs, federally qualified health centers around New Jersey are great resources for people to access treatment. Um, and then also the uh, Governor Murphy had required um, them to waive patient fees for testing and COVID-19 related diagnostic services for those who lacked health insurance. So, and then there's, oh, there's one in every county. So I do, even prior to the pandemic, I encourage clients to use, these res um, to use these resources if they don't have health insurance particularly, because they do provide services, an immense amount of services to clients on an income base, ba um, you know, ba based on their income. So they provide a lot of them, provide medical, mental health, dental services. So they are, they are like a spectacular resource for the immigrant community. Um, and so there's, obviously there's very, for COVID-19 there's like, last I checked there was 46 testing centers around New Jersey, including the FQHCs, pharmacies and some hospitals. And then, um, like I said, USCIS posted the alert to the website, clarifying that they will not consider testing, treatment or preventative care. Oh, including vaccines if a vaccine becomes available related to COVID-19 in a public charge in admissibility determination. Um, so we're gonna go to the next slide. Oh my goodness. Sorry. <laughs> no idea why it's not turned off. I'm sorry guys, really the technology end of it, obviously I'm still catching on as you can see. <laughs> okay, sorry. So going into some of the mental health resources, because of the vast amount of isolation that exists as well within our communities and with in response to the pandemic, it's been a kind of a, collect, a collective trauma for our country, for our society. And the, you know, a lot of our seniors are even more isolated maybe than before in that sense. You know, as I said, like even some of mine who are in their senior homes confined to their, to their apartments, it's, it's very, you know, daunting. So I've been trying um, to identify just different uh, mental health resources around New Jersey that are obviously immigrant friendly, have some language access for people to be able to talk to somebody and reach out um, when, you know, just to have that connection still and to make sure that their mental health is still intact because it's super important. Um, FQHEs, like I said, they provide a lot of behavioral health services. Um, obviously with the, the, um, the CMS expansion of telehealth, the waiver was super helpful in that sense. Um, Governor uh, Murphy has passed a lot of e executive orders to providing further access for um, folks to receive these services through telehealth over the phone. Um, and, you know, getting 
a lot of behavioral health uh, service providers on the front lines. Um, so there's, you know, these are some programs that I utilize um, with our uh, community around New Jersey. Uh, the Jewish Family Services across New Jersey has different types of programming depending on the office. But some of that point that I uh, caught my attention, they have a COVID-19 mental health support line in their northern New Jersey location, uh, counseling and support groups, medication, ma medication management for older adults. And then Rutgers Focus Wellness Center is awesome too. They provide mental health services and specifically advertise available to all regardless of insurance or immigration status, which is great. Um, and then NASW New Jersey has also created a listserv for people to find a therapist a lot easier. Um, so you can go right on their website and go on the listserv, find a therapist maybe in your area, maybe with a specific need and um, different uh, skills and qualifications. So it's super helpful in that sense. Um, and part of our programming, we have funding that we've received for to address mental health. So part of what we do in our office, I connect our clients who have mental health needs to a uh, private therapist or programming, and we assist them in the cost of that um, to receive treatment that they need, and as well as helping them access uh, psychological evaluations. Um, may, uh, many of them require those to as evidential support for their immigration applications, and they can be very costly and not in the range of what our clients can afford. So we provide that access to them as well. And we could go to the next slide. <clears throat> so some financial resources, and this was a huge one because there's not a lot around New Jersey, obviously, or in general. Um, you know, with a lot with the unemployment system in New Jersey, I think we all know um, it was uh, very difficult for a lot of folks. Um, so some of my clients that are seniors are still working. Um, so having them, even if they do qualify for unemployment benefits, many people have been waiting or, or waiting. And obviously the state has been trying their best to address that. Um, but what I identified for private funding in the community, because I do have some undocumented clients as well, the United Way has like developed a huge Alice Recovery Fund. Um, depending on which United Way you access, some of them you would have to apply directly. Um, some of them distributed the funding um, to their community partners. So I reached out to all of them around New Jersey to kind of get that information and distribute it amongst clients who, depending on what area of New Jersey they live in, to assist them with getting um, some rental assistance um, or utilities or food access. And there's also been some municipal initiatives like I know the mayor of Newark uh, developed a rental assistance initiative for COVID-19. There's also been um, different private do donors who have given to different community grassroots organizations and distributing gift cards to undocumented immigrants. And if you go to the next slide, I can show you some of the um, grassroots partners that I'm aware of around that have re uh, received some um, private funding for COVID-19 assistance. If you have clients maybe who would be able to benefit from it. Um, so these are some participating organizations. A lot of them are, are different um, grassroots immigrants, pro immigrant programs around New Jersey or coalition partners. Um, so you can take a look and there's different locations around New Jersey, everywhere from Red Bank to Hudson County, Trenton, Mercer County. Um, and Janelle, we can share these, these slides with folks afterwards so that if they aren't able to capture this information right now, they'll have it later for use. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Terrific. Thank you. Um, the contact information, I think a lot of them are, that are listed though, however, on this list are executive directors of the programming. So you can probably more likely just Google like office or participating organizations website and contact them directly about it. And then we can go to the next slide. So food resources and food access has been a huge one. Um, there have obviously I you know always depending on the part of New Jersey our clients are in I start with maybe the Community Food Bank of New Jersey, uh, Fulfill, uh, Norris Cap. So depending on the counties that they're in, these are the huge uh, three uh, food distributors in New Jersey. Depending on, on the different counties that have been assisting and and really helping so many of our residents and so many of our seniors. Um, and there's always been pop-up food distribution or emergency meal kits prepared for grab and goes. So we've been really eyeing that me and uh, my intern to try to sh distribute and share that with um, our clients, our colleagues, um, everybody basically on our email serves that they, we feel like could um, benefit from it. And we've also noticed too that there have been like um, 
a resurgence of pop-ups and mutual aid groups around New Jersey. So a lot of the community members have stepped up to help a lot of our vulnerable uh, residents in New Jersey. And um, they have Facebook groups, um, North Jersey Mutual Aid, Central Jersey, and South Jersey. So these in community members were um, banding together um, and collecting community donations, buying groceries for people and delivering them to them, uh, de uh, delivering food and meals to seniors. It's been really amazing um, to see the community really band together and be able to help, uh, especially helping us with a lot of our clients even. I've had some of them help some of my clients directly as well, and it's been awesome. So, and then one of the bigger barriers, the issues that I had identified initially with COVID when it started, what the pandemic so much here was, even my uh, seniors with SNAP benefits were afraid to go out to grocery stores or didn't have, you know, PPE, like the proper mask, um, or just, you know, just were, were sick and couldn't go out um, to actually access their food. So now too, I, I was doing research and I, came across an article how some states had launched a pilot program for SNAP benefic beneficiaries to order groceries online. And then not too long after our state follows suit, which I'm so grateful for and awesome because it's been a super help for um, a lot of our seniors to be able to get the groceries that they need. Um, so that's been super helpful. Um, yeah. But this is basically some of the partners that I've been, I use to um, provide food access to our clients. We can go to the next slide. And like I said, anybody who's interested and wants to get in touch with grassroots organizations or coalition partners, these are just a couple, there's still more. Um, but if you want more, maybe closer to your area, I would start with the first one, New Jersey Alliance for Immigrant Justice. They're actually located in the same building we're in in Newark, but they, um, they act as the, basically the focal point of a lot of different coalition groups around New Jersey. Um, they do a lot of immigrant adv advocacy and policy work. But even on their website, they have a list of all their partners, um, which include us and a, a lot of people around the um, state. We have Wind of the Spirit in Morristown, Dover area, Make the Road, New Jersey's and Elizabeth, First Friends of New Jersey and New York and Kearney, Centro Comunitario Seos in, in Union City, Catholic Charities of Trent and Lakewood, American Friends Service Committee, us in Newark and Red Bank. And then there's many others you can find, like I said, on the NJIJ website. And we can go to the next slide. And that's pretty much it. If there's any questions, I'm open. Let's see. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Janelle, one question came through. Do you only assist the seniors or can anyone use your services? So I assist seniors. Um, I do accept outside referrals, depending on the capacity I'm at at the moment. Um, but yeah, I have received some referrals for outside seniors. So if you do have a referral, I, I encourage you definitely to reach out and contact me. Okay. And what are some current ways that we can advocate for older immigrants? Some current ways we can advocate for older immigrants. That's a great question. Um, definitely in the in the um, in any midst of policy policy efforts for our seniors or any programming um, decisions that are being made on a higher level, um, I do think it's important to incorporate, well, um, the needs of senior, our senior clients in that sense, and incorporate them into the conversation or include them in the conversation. Um, a lot of programming, like I said, for seniors that we have in New Jersey is really great, but there's really just a, a lack of, I think, of inclusion in that sense because it's, it's not even just like about the cult it's not a cultural barrier obviously for inclusion wise but it's more so about immigration status is a huge deterrent for people um and it's not even necessarily clients who are undocumented but different statuses like i said they don't have pathways to citizenship it's super difficult i, I have um like a, a a 73 year old client originally from togo but she hasn't made her uh 10 years of work or 40 quarters of work yet. So she is kind of in limbo um, in a sense of affordability. She doesn't really, she can't work with a lot of health issues. So she's very, she's supported a lot by her uh, community um, in a sense. We were able, I was able to get her into um, senior housing, which was super helpful because the cost of living obviously is such a huge uh, issue for a lot of people, including seniors. 
but things like that. I think just basically trying to, you know, maybe speak up for them in different initiatives and higher levels for our seniors. Well, what about, what about these clients? What about them? What, what safety net programs we have for them? I think safety nets are a huge one too. I mean, you know, I, I, that I, it's not really like a specific answer, I guess to say, but I think definitely trying to remember them and incorporate them in any conversations um, for de decisions being made on higher levels can definitely be helpful. Okay. Or like I said, reach out to grassroots organizations to see if any of they have any initiatives that they are taking um, place in to perpetuate that. And have you seen an increased need for grief counseling for families whose family member passed away to COVID, as well as other residents who may have friends with them and may be fearful that they are next? If so, what assistance is provided? Yeah, so there has definitely been a need for uh, grief counseling and we've been trying to identify different um, resources around for that. Um, I definitely try to be a, a, you know, a general support for my clients. I mean, I, I call them all the time now, like more so even <laughs> than before, just because I want them to know like, are you okay? You know, I'm here. How's everything going? Um, but there, you know, there's that there, a lot of them are definitely fearful um, because people, you know, maybe in their living build in their buildings have passed away or, you know, there's, and this is a huge thing. They watch the news so much. <laughs> so it's very, and I, I did like a quick, uh, traumatic stress training to my, uh, colleagues earlier when this began. And one, something I encouraged them to do was to turn the TV off <laughs> because, it just felt after a point every single day with the news, the media, it's like every day reinforcing the traumatic stress of this pandemic, hearing the numbers of people passing away. It's, it's really daunting and really like not conducive for somebody's mental health. So, I mean, I just try to encourage them also to maybe try to not watch the news. I mean, it, it isn't a difficult, it's difficult in a sense. And my, my clients too, like they, technology, they haven't been too bad. Like, so, you know, they still keep in touch with family members through uh, social media outlets like Facebook or WhatsApp. So I, I do feel like they get a little connected, connected there. Um, but as far as like with the grief, there's definitely a fear. So I try to provide them, depending on the individual, the type of support that might be more beneficial for them, especially depending on their technology access level, the language. Um, it's not always easy, obviously, um, but I try my best. And like I said, we have um, some funding to connect people for therapy for our clients. So I definitely will find them a therapist to provide them those services over the phone and at no cost to them. Okay. And some non-immigrant prisoners have recently been released based on their age and concerns over COVID. Have these concerns affected ICE detentions have ICE arrests and detentions slowed down during COVID? So given the reports um, from my colleagues and other partners, even around the country, ICE has not necessarily slowed down detaining individuals or even releasing. Um, there have been a lot of uh, widespread lawsuits that even our, um, some of our legal staff has signed on to. Um, just because they, some uh, ICE is not releasing some certain clients who are very high risk to COVID. Um, and I don't know if people have read certain articles now that they're saying ICE has been using very harmful um, disinfectants, I guess, within the ICE detention facilities. So um, a lot of them are having adverse effects to it as far as um, skin sores, oh, difficult breathing, difficulty breathing, um, just getting sick. Um, and so it's been, it's been difficult in that sense, but we have, I mean, ICE, I will say, I guess in a sense, they will try to release, seniors are kind of viewed as, you know, less of a risk to the community. So they, they would probably be the first to be released, especially those with severe health issues. But our, our attorneys have been working with doctors um, who have, you know, provided over the phone examinations as far as reviewing medical records when people have uh, medical issues to steer ICE and provide them like with a letter stating how high risk this client will be for COVID to, um, for, to COVID-19 due to their health issues to perpetuate ICE's uh, decision-making in a sense of releasing our clients that are, you know, very vulnerable in that sense. Um, 
but it's still always a challenge. They don't, ICE has not stopped detaining people and they have not released everybody who's vulnerable. So it's just still a work in process right now. And then there was one comment that some residents at the new community corporation, NCC Roseville, were recipients of the gift cards you mentioned uh, in Newark. Oh, awesome. Yes, I'm so glad. That's good, That's good <laughs> news. And I'm turning it back to you, Melissa. Terrific. Um, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for your questions. And thank you, Janelle and Katie, for um, great presentations and a lot of um, great information for, uh, for our attendees. Uh, really appreciative of your time and your effort in that. Uh, and so um, we will, uh, as we did last time, be um, presenting or uh, sharing uh, slides uh, and other um, information. Oh, here we go. There we go. Uh, we will be sharing uh, slides uh, and other a recording uh, of this with all uh, registrants. You'll probably see an email from me um, uh, on Monday with a link to the recording as well as any slides and additional information that we can share with you from today. Uh, and again, I'm really thankful um, to our sponsors, Carl Archer, Archer Law and AARP New Jersey, as well as our two panelists today um, for joining us and sharing such great information. Um, since we are slightly early, do either of you, uh, Katie or Janelle, have any last uh, words of advice or information for our uh, attendees? No. Great. I just got one more question in, if I may, Melissa. Oh, please, go ahead. How do I get my seniors tested? Oh. I'm in well, Irvington, New Jersey, and the mayor's staff had promised to test my seniors, and now they're ignoring my phone calls. Oh. Well, uh, I know, Janelle, you shared some information in your slides about testing centers. Um, perhaps we can connect with that person offline and get them some advocacy tips on getting, uh, getting over some of their local barriers to get tested. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, yeah, I definitely, there should be a, a, a FQHC in that area. I know um, for Essex County, Newark has a couple. Um, I wanna see if there's somewhere closer maybe to Irvington. I have to mm -hmm. like check that out, but mm -hmm. we can definitely look into that on, on, the, on the sidebar and I can try to see what we can find for them. Great. So we will, uh, we will try to connect you then uh, with that person and, uh, or at least follow up with them and get uh, some answers uh, for that. So again, greatly appreciate both of your time uh, and effort in putting together some great presentations. So thank you for that. And um, we do want to remind you, as I said in the beginning, that this is a, um, the second installment in a series. And so we have our third and final webinar in this series will take place uh, not next Friday, but the Friday after that, June 26th, uh, and that we will feature uh, three uh, presenters, uh, Charles Clarkson from the Senior Medicare Patrol of New Jersey and Frank Winter from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, who will be talking to us about scams as well as updates to Medicare and Medicaid uh, benefits during uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then we'll also be hearing from Christine Newman at AARP New Jersey about some caregiving tips and information and how this has impacted caregivers um, during uh, the COVID crisis. So um, again, please, if you haven't already, register for that uh, event. Um, and join us there. And please do stay tuned to uh, NJFA's social media pages and website for more information about other content that we'll be sharing. Um, for uh, those of you who might be very familiar with our organization and are used to joining us in person in June for our annual conference, um, we're just as sad as you are probably that we're not all together in person, but we are working on some things to bring you um, throughout the summer so that we can all stay engaged and connected um, and share information. So please do stay tuned for that information. Um, and if you have any questions or concerns, please do reach out to us and let us know. Um, we're very interested in hearing from you and what other information you'd like to know um, that we can that we can share with you. So, so please do stay in touch uh, and stay connected. And thanks again um, to Janelle and Katie for joining us uh, and to our sponsors uh, of the series. And we look forward to seeing you all in a couple weeks. Thank you. Take care.